Welcome to Trailer Video T4. In this video, I'm going to show you the nine easy steps of how to purge 90% of the human population and come across looking like a hero. Now, suppose you are the leader of the world. You, you are told that the existing world resources can only sustain 10% of the existing world population. So how would you reduce the world population by 90% without looking like a monster? And better, is there a way to do it and look like you're actually the hero? Now, you might be asking, well, where does this crazy scenario come from? In, in my T3 video, I do a back of the napkin engineering calculation of what the carrying capacity of the earth is, assuming that all the oil and other underground minerals have been mined out. And that level, that number of people came out to be a comfortable level of people would be 10% of current population. Now, a lot of people mistake the video in assuming that, that oh, they say, yeah, well, you can easily fit all the people in the world on Maine. Okay, and it's not the, the housing of the people. It's not even energy. What we get from oil is amazing. We get pesticides. But antibiotics, fertilizers, uh, weed control products. We get all kinds of these products that help yield, improve the yield of farming by a factor of 10. That is what our Achilles heel is, is growing food, not energy, not, not places to put people. It's growing food. Without oil, we're going to seriously impact our ability to grow food. Now, this, was, this whole video was inspired by the Agenda 21 of the United Nations. At the time I made the video, the United Nations has not published what they believe the sustainable population level of the Earth was. Well, they have recently put out a number, and that number is 75%. In other words, a 75% reduction of people is required to attain sustainability. Uh, according to my numbers, that 75% is going to be a very poor standard of living, people living in like, you know, with, with almost starvation levels of food. But anyway, from the T1 video, which I did before the T3 video, all I did was make the assumption that at one time, the population of the earth is going to be over capacity for the earth. I knew that day was coming. I did not know until I did the T3 video that that day is already come and gone and we're living on borrowed time because of oil. So, but in the T1 video, I looked at all the possible options for taking uh, care of humanity into the future. And the only two solutions I came up with were extermination or exodus. Extermination really like purge. And so my solution is exodus. We build starships and take as much flora and fauna with us as possible, spread the ecological diversity of Earth to the stars. Now, this video, I show that there's so many more benefits from Exodus, like having other planets you can rely on in case you have a plague on one of the sister planets. They can, they can help each other out. By putting, keeping everybody on the Earth and reducing the population by 90%, all we're doing is setting up a short-term solution because we can have all our eggs in one basket and it'll take one meteorite strike, one plague, one everything, and the human race will be wiped out. And so our survival, the long-term survival of the human race requires us to spread out to the stars. That'll give us redundancy. And so the caveats from video one are, you know, that, you know, a population reduction strategy such as a purge will only ever be a short-term solution. And caveat two, in order for the distinti plan to work, we have to break the light barrier by at least a factor of 500. I know a lot of scientists are going to balk at that. Um, I believe we can in my research on ethereal mechanics, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, if we, if we can't break the light barrier by a factor of 500, then the only solution we have is a purge. So getting back on with the theme of this video, assuming that's the only solution we have, how would you do it? Let's do some brainstorming. Well, you could do outright extermination. You know, use deadly force, round everybody up, put them into extermination camps, or, you know, make everybody go into a suicide booth. But, you know, there's no way that you're going to build an army big enough 
to do that with a world population the size it is. And ultimately, the people in the army that you're going to, are going to realize that some of them are going to have to go into the extermination. So you're never going to be able to. You're going to have a revolt, and you're going to be machine gunned into a ditch. And so any any plan to save the human race will die with a plan like this. So we're not going to do outright extermination. Okay, and this is echoed in a Star Trek episode called The Conscience of the King, where the leader of a deep space colony butchered some of his people to enable the remaining to survive on the limited rations they had. And the as fate would have it, uh, rescue ships were already in progress to getting and rescuing the planet, but the people of the planet did not know this, and so the extermination was... the not necessary and that was the moral dilemma of this episode of star trek well we could try to you know put a plague on the earth you know as, as was done in the story of the mark of gideon another star trek episode the problem is you'd still be the bad guy because you know and obviously you would you, you would have to do it surreptitiously but the bigger problem is it could backfire and kill everyone I mean, if you make a plague that's 90% lethal, it only has to mutate a little bit, become 100% lethal. And that would take everybody out, and then your plans of saving the human race are down the toilet. And the other one is that other movie that did a plague nature of government, uh, you know, controlling the population is V for Vendetta. War. Well, gee, maybe we could kind of do what they did in World War One. You know, has basically, uh, gee, you know, the leaders of the of the kings of all the crowns of Europe decided that their people were restless and they needed to get rid of some of their people, so they decided let's go to war with each other. But the problem when you do that is the problem that happened in World War One. Some some leaders got to the point point that they thought hey we could game the system and try to take control now that's my opinion of world war one only because it doesn't make sense that the entire world would go to war over the death of one man it doesn't make any sense it looked more like me as it looked like a purge because when you have people that are starting to shoot kings then the kings become fearful of their people okay so they went to war in my opinion all the kings were married and they're all you know had you know, intermarried, their families were all intermarried as if for good relations. And so it doesn't make any sense that they went to war over each other. They looks more like they got together and said, let's, you know, let's, let's, let's make these people who are shooting at us shoot at each other instead. That's what it felt like to me. Okay. But anyway, if you were going to try to do a war, you would have to organize this with all the other countries on the world, make some kind of limited exchange, a limited this, a limited that. Okay. Ultimately, it could backfire on you because when you have a war, you create really bad ec ecological conditions where plagues could arrive. Just like what happened at the end of World War One, you had the, the swine flu, which killed, I think, 18 million people. Okay, and ultimately, you're going to wreck the ecology, you're going to wreck your economy, and there's no way that a war for, for reducing population is ever going to work out, especially the number of people that would need to be killed in a war like that. So this is not, not going to be an option. Forced birth control. Again, if you try to do this, you're going to look like the villain. It's very likely you're, you're going to get, you're not going to get uh, uh, 7 billion people to stop screwing so i don't think you're this is going to work this would be like trying to herd cats there's no way you're going to do this so at this point whatever you're doing you've got to do it you've got to get get it done such that it can't be blamed on you otherwise you'll have a big revolt and when you have a revolt and people put you down of course, they're not going to be thinking in terms of the overall survival of the human race, and so no one's going to survive. You're, you're going to, you're just going to, it's going to be a nightmare. We're going to, and so you have to get people to do what you want and make them think it is their idea. That is the trick here. So a purge might be the way to go. You get everybody to kill each other else. But how do you do that? How do you do that with on a scale large enough and a lethality large enough where you can achieve your 90% cull. 
percentage. And it's amazing that we got these crazy movies that are actually proposing this actual idea. Well, the first step is you got to reduce the education level. Because smart people, intelligent, educated people, people like, you know, engineers and scientists and whatever, they're going to figure out a way. They're not going they're not going to they're not going to fall into their baser instinct. They're going to say, "Hey, this is a challenge. We can solve this problem." And they may end up finding a way to work together and solving the problem and coming up and, and reducing your wonderful plan to kill 90% of the people. Okay. Okay. What you want is nations full of idiots. Okay. That will easily revert to their baser instinct and start killing each other over scraps of food. Even killing each other over fun because they, they don't know anything else. They have nothing else to fall back on. And as an example here, you know, let's say, let's give you the, the example here is, let's say we have these escape pods. There's two escape pods left and your starship, which is in deep space, is, you know, ready to uh, explode and everyone's, and there's only two escape pods and you have one escape pod here uh, and you're in deep space. So you're very, very, very far from human civilization. The odds that any one of these escape pods are going to make it back to civilization is virtually zero. Okay, so you have one escape pod. We got lots of engineers and physicists going into, and you have another escape pod where there's the basically a whole bunch of idiots. And I'm showing a picture from the movie Idiocracy going into this one. In which shuttle would you go into? Which shuttle do you think would have the most likelihood of being able to overcome the obstacles of the long journey and make it back to civilization without reverting to cannibalism? or some other Lord of the Flies solution of, you know, outcome. So I'll let you figure that one out. Step two, this is very important. You need to fracture society. You need to make everybody angry with everybody else. So you can find ways to divide them by race, race, ethnicity, age, gender, wealth, Religion. Hey, even let's throw in some extra genders, ambiguous genders, and then put laws in place that puts people in jail for refute for, for incorrectly using the proper pronoun for somebody. See, that's a way to really stir the pot and make people angry with each other. You put in crazy crap like that. So intentionally, you got to do stuff to intentionally stir the pot all the time. Even going out there and calling for civil war, like no one's thinking about civil war, but all, all these media people are calling for civil war and yada, yada, yada. Uh, I'm sorry. That's it. Uh, anyway. Okay. And also by keeping the people stupid, what you did in the previous step reduces the possibility that they will figure out that all of this pot stirring is by design. And this division among everybody will pit them against each other rather than teaming up against you. Kind of what I believe was done in World War I. Let's get all the, the, the peasants of all these nations fighting each other instead of fighting the kings. Step three, confiscatory gun control. Well, people don't realize because of the way the news handles the truth is that the overwhelming overwhelming number of gun owners are good people who obey the law and these good gun owners are likely to contain and defeat your purge just like in the 1992 LA riots the Korean store owners armed themselves against the rioters now, none of the rioters were shot, but the show of deadly force was enough to keep the rioters from spilling out into the Korean areas. And so here, without a shot fired, the show of deadly force kept the rioters in check. Okay, and so if you're going to, what you want to do then is you want to disarm the good people. And only the good people are going to obey the confiscatory gun control laws. And all the psychopaths and criminals and all the other deranged people out there are going to be, still have their guns, are going to be able to get guns. And so that is the purpose of the confiscatory gun control. And also, it, it gets, makes sure that you, the government, are the only other people who have guns. 
Okay, and then so you're it's in it's in your best interest then to use whatever horrible event you can to forward gun control agenda and to silence any story or evidence showing how lives could be saved with civilian gun ownership. In fact, if you can, you could try to create gun massacres so you can push this agenda along. Okay, and, and you say, well, no one would ever create a gun massacre to push a political agenda. Well, I ask you to go on Wikipedia and look up Operation Northwoods. Operation Northwoods. The CIA had planned a gun massacre of American civilians. This is during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then plant evidence framing Cuban uh, communists. And the purpose for that was to gin up the American people for an invasion of Cuba. That plan was vetoed, for lack of a better word, by President John F. Kennedy. And a few weeks later, John F. Kennedy was assassinated by somebody who was a quote unquote communist sympathizer who said, I am a patsy. Basically, I am being blamed for this. I didn't do it. So that our government, that any government can do this. Our government can do it. Any government can do it. You get people in government who believe that the ends justify the means. Okay. And so it is not out of the question that possibly the Las Vegas shooting was a setup because why, why do you need to break two windows if you can only shoot one gun at a time? There's so many things in that that just say, why, why, why? Why do you bring 27 guns when you can only shoot one at a time? Maybe you have another one in case the barrel gets hot. I don't know. It just seems to be, there's just too many things that just don't make sense. But then again, you get crazy people and they don't make sense. So whatever. Okay, so you need to get rid, you got to make sure your society is not armed. You, you want to make sure the good people are not armed. Step four, you need to create violent enclaves. Create concentrations of very poorly educated, very violent, angry people, people that you keep telling it that, the, the, that their situation is not their fault, it's everybody else's fault. So make them angry and divisive and, and, and violent against everybody else. But you have to find a way to contain them in the time till until the time is right. Okay. Uh, then what you do is in these enclaves you look the other way as these enclaves degrade into gang-like social constructs. Okay. Do not send police into the area. Okay. You're just going to get your police force killed. Uh, put your police force in danger. And do nothing about the weapons and drugs. Just look the other way. Let them be alone. Let them fester. And then the way you contain them is you give them free stuff to placate them until the time is right. Okay, this could be someplace like Detroit or Baltimore, any any American uh, heavily, you know, um, any democratically run city center in America, you know, follows this plan, it looks like. Or maybe we have those enclaves in Europe everybody talks about. Say it looks like the same thing to me. Step five, you're going to need to put in place a plan to seize food. Well, better off, Obama did it better. He put in a plan, an executive order, which is documented in an article on 3 April 2013, where he's nationalizing, put in orders to be able to nationalize everything, energy, food, water, and everything else. But the reason why you need to, to seize the food, essentially, and the energy, actually, but more of the food, is because... If you can control the food, you can control the people. Build large scale internment camps, and we'll explain their purpose later. Step seven, make the purge, the idea of a purge commonplace. Okay, you put out games like Grand Theft Auto where murder, rape, and theft are all given bonus points and awards. You know, put out, come out with movies like The Purge, make it look stylish and fun and like a game. Step seven, get people conditioned to the fact that they are going to be judged based on their utility to the government. In other words, are they doctors or are they engineers? If, if you have people that the socialists call useless eaters, what do you do with them? Well, I'm going to let you figure that out. Step eight, you're going to have, a, have to have a plan to shut down all communication. You don't want people communicating and getting together and figuring out, hey, wait a minute. There, there's something stupid there. 
There's, this, this doesn't make any sense. You don't want that. You want people in darkness so they can't coordinate and the purge will just happen. Then you need a trigger. You need a trigger. You need the ability to shut down the purchasing power overnight. You can either do that by a hyperinflationary event, which makes money worthless, or you can do it by eliminating cash or seriously reducing cash and making all, at most, if not all, transactions electronic, which gives you the ability to shut down the economy at the flip of a switch. Okay, ultimately, the purpose of this is that if people can't buy food, they are going to riot. And you can see it was probably already tested here that the shoppers at a few Walmarts, they had an EBT problem and the um, the enclave people rioted and robbed and trashed the store, basically emptied it of all of its contents. And so you see right there that a simple day or two without the EBT working work beautifully to get your plan going. So when do you pull the trigger? Well, you need something to blame. You just can't pull the trigger and make money worthless or purchasing power worthless overnight. You need some kind of event that you can reasonably blame as the cause of the, of the banking system going down. So you'll need to wait for some kind of terrorist attack, a large volcano or tsunami, Maybe a, a nuclear detonation, whether accidental or intentional. Maybe even a large meteorite strike. I mean, what's been in the news recently is all this talk about, oh, oh, gee, the, 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 the America could be completely shut down with a high altitude EMP. And that's been like the focus of a lot of news stories in the past six or several months. So if anything, they're getting, it looks like that's going to be their choice of operation because they're getting used to the idea and they're educating us to the idea that everything could be shut down overnight by one EMP over the United States. So that looks like that's what the plan is if in fact the government is doing this. Is it coincidence? I don't know. I don't have any inside knowledge of what I'm telling you is happening, but all these things are happening. Okay, ultimately you need something large enough that could be blamed as the cause of the shutdown when in fact it's really you shutting it down. And it won't matter, even if that thing is big enough to shut down, you're gonna make sure all of it goes down with the trigger you're gonna put in, that you put in place. Okay, so once you pull the trigger, there's gonna be absolute pandemonium because when people can't buy food because the system is down, they'll blame the shop owners, not you, and they are just going to go crazy. And it'll be such, such a large scale, the police force are not gonna be able to do anything about it. They're just gonna sit around and just let it burn itself out. Then while all the pandemonium is going on, you pull the other trigger to see is all the food, energy, and all the other things that you have in place. And because there's no internet, and there's no uh, news communication, no one will know that this is what you're doing. Okay, so the purpose of this is to deny any food from making it into, this, into the urban areas or the countryside or anywhere else and getting people basically to go crazy over starvation. Okay, then what you do is once you've determined that your population levels have been achieved, you know, when the time is right and the people are hungry, cold and afraid, then you declare martial law and require all the survivors to report to processing centers where they receive food, shelter, and security. Now, this is where you come across as the savior. You're saving them from themselves without realizing that you're the one who caused all the problems to begin with. So upon entry to the processing facility, you confiscate all their possessions, including weapons. Okay, you blame everything on them. You say, you know, you, you people just can't handle your rights and privileges. You know, freedom is, is human beings are not capable of having freedom or freedom of speech and right to bear arms, all this stuff, you are just not capable. So you make them sign a form, giving up all their rights in return for food, shelter, and security. And now you can have absolute dominion over them. Then you put them on a train to the internment camps. You separate people with viable skills. Okay, but how else would you separate people? You know, maybe what do you do with all the useless eaters? The people that have no skills at all and just consume resources. That's what the socialists call them. And who, who gets to choose? Well, I guess 
because you've made them sign over all their rights, you have the absolute power to choose. What would you do? And what about all the preppers out there? There's a lot of people out there that are preparing for such a situation as this. Okay, are you going to send out troops to go round them all up? No, that would be stupid to do that. Remember, you need to make it look like you're the hero in this situation. Where, you know, and, and you really are, because if, if, if I can't get faster than the light starships going, then the only solution is going to be a purge. There is no other solution here. Uh, that I can, unless some kind of new technology is comes forward, whatever, this is the only option out there. So essentially, you are trying to care for the human race. And the last thing you want to do is send out troops after all these preppers to round them up, because all you're going to do by, by, you know, by instituting, because essentially you're going to have to go out there with guns. And so basically you're going to be aggressive toward them. And all you're going to confirm to them is that you are evil and all these preppers are going to unify against you, even causing attacks on your facilities, making it difficult for you to process the people that are coming in. So what you want to do is let them be. Okay, you let them be, they're going to think, okay, this you, the government's not a threat to us. And it gives the appearance that you respect their choice and do not mean them harm in any way. But because most of them will not make it, okay, they will eventually run out of something or a blight will kill their seed crops or they will suffer an accident requiring medical attention. Basically, because you have seized everything else, you are going to eventually have something that they will eventually need. And because you have not shown any aggression toward them, they are more likely to come forward willingly and be interned without incident um, when they have a problem. Remember, you still need to look like the hero here. Well, you know, you are actually, because again, if, if the distinty guy can't get faster than light starships going, then this is our only alternative. And it's better to save some, you know, people. So I mean, I'm, there's a, you know there's a there's a double edge. It's the same that same dilemma with that Star Trek episode. Some may actually make it. Okay, most preppers really actually don't test their prepper supplies. They don't actually try to live off them for like a year to see if their prepping plans have everything accounted for. So most of them are are, are not going to make it. But there's some might make it. Okay, some may actually become totally self-sufficient, living off the land. However, these, these people that actually make it are going to be few and far between, and those people that can and are willing to live a life of, of loneliness, pretty much. Okay, and in either case, they're self-sufficient. So this, this, this fits in with your plan of getting the human race self-sufficient. Okay, um, and they're going to be too few to bother with. Now, the picture I'm showing here is the picture from Logan's Run with Peter Ustinov playing the guy that's not in the city. And the reason why I chose this picture as the guy that's living outside of the system, um, you know, is because Logan's Run is like the, the only movie that kind of makes sense as far as if you had to do a purge, what would be the solution you put in after the purge to maintain the long-term stability of the human race? Okay, and the, the, the society put forward in Logan Run all makes more sense. OK, you get tight control over population resources, all managed by AI. You don't want humans in charge. Humans are just going to they're, they're humans are just going to corrupt. Humans are going to just take the system and just start making it. They're just going to destroy it. Humans destroy every government they have ever made. So you want an impartial uh, AI system if such a thing could be built. OK, then the system is ultimately going to have to do a, a little purge every now and again. And in the case of Logan's run, they exterminate everybody uh, that attains the age of 30 years old. And since the Logan's Run is a closed ecosystem separate from the environment, I think that might be a good idea. But again, what I've said before in my T1 trailer is any solution other than Exodus is only going to be temporary. Again, you're putting all your eggs in one basket, one super volcano, one large asteroid impact, yada 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 one plague and the whole human race is wiped out in the t1 video i show that if there are multiple sister planets out there with humans they could self-support each other when there's a problem on one planet okay so 
And, you know, like I said, and, and even the, the Logan's Run solution was temporary because ultimately in the Logan's Run story, there were people who who did not want to live that lifestyle, who just who rationalized that, gee, given 30 years of life and being exterminated at age 30 is not how I want to live. And that underground people looking for, uh, what was it, uh, sanctuary kept growing and growing and growing. So, yeah, you cannot have a stagnant society like that. People want new horizons. Okay, so the T1, we have to break the light barrier. There's no, there's no other solution. If there's no other solution, if, if we cannot break the light barrier, then a purge is going to be the only other way out. So at least that's what I believe. So what do you believe? Do you believe there's a different solution? Okay, the solu two solutions that I came up with through all the videos so far is either a purge, a 90% purge or a 90% exodus. Do you have a different solution? Is there some something I have not considered, which is possible. I'm not perfect. So I want to thank all my Patreon folks for sticking with me. Um, if you want to go to my Patreon site, there's some free papers. My Patreon site is ethereummechanics.com. I have a paper called Transvariance, which replaces special relativity where special relativity only says you can't go faster than the speed of light, uh, the, the ethereal mechanics will eventually show the reason why that actually that reason will be in the electrogravity paper, which is underway, why you can't go faster than the speed of light. And because we now know why, okay, there is a workaround to the why, which will make a thousand times the speed of light slow gear. So I'm pretty sure that the, the speed of light will be broken. Because you got to remember over the history, you had physicists saying well, trains couldn't go more than 40 miles an hour, otherwise all the air would be sucked out and people would die. Well, engineers pushed it. We're going 300 miles an hour now. When they're trying to break the sound barrier, physicists said, well, the, 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 the force on the aircraft goes up by the square of the velocity. And so at the speed of light, it's going to be virtually infinite. I'm sorry, at the speed of sound, it's going to be virtually infinite. Well, engineers broke the sound barrier. Okay, engineers are going to break the light barrier too. Trust me, it may not be me, but it's going to be some other engineer, not a physicist. Physicists are the dumbest asses I've ever worked with in my life. Okay, so, okay, the, that light barrier will be broken. It has to be broken. We have no other alternative. Okay, my work says it, we're going to break the light barrier by a factor of at least a thousand or even more. Okay, so if you want some of these papers, go to my, my these are free. Transvariance paper is the latest one out. Um, you just go to the Ethereum Mechanics and look up transvariance in the keywords, and it'll bring you to the latest version of the paper, which I think it's either 1.2 or 1.3. In the transvariance paper is a PDF, and in the PDF there are links to videos which will show you the animations that show you that the, the relativists have not considered all of the things necessary to reconcile the Michael Samorla experiment with observation. And because of that, Things like length contraction and time dilation are not a space-time thing. They're just a property of matter. And those things can be now worked around because they're not built into space-time. They're properties of matter. So I, I ask you to go there, look at my stuff. If you can, support this because I'm trying to do this on my own time. And I got a lot of Patreon supporters who are helping me out and they're helping me be able to offload some of the other things I need to do so I can spend more time on ethereal mechanics. Thank you very much. Thank you for all my Patreon people that are supporting this effort. Um, I appreciate it.